Now let's first talk about risk. Imagine that somebody, you know, wants to help you out financially and they give you two options. They say, hey, I could just give you $5,000. No questions asked, no strings attached. That's one option. Or another option they'll present to you is, you know, how about let's flip a fair coin. If you get a head, heads, I'll give you $10,000. But if you get tails, I'll give you zero. Try to think about what you would do in that scenario. Would you like the one option, option B, let's call it, where you get just the $5,000, or option A, where it's the heads or tails. You might get $10,000, or you might get zero. You know? Here's the thing. There's not a single right answer to that. Different people will answer it in different ways. Some people might even say that they're completely indifferent between the two options, and they really can't choose, and they give them the same happiness level. Now, here's the thing. Based on how people make this decision, you can sometimes tell whether they're what we're going to call risk averse, risk neutral, or risk loving. So here's the thing. Any person in the world, for any given numbers, you can sort of determine what type of risk profile they have. Are they risk loving, risk neutral, or risk averse? Now, in this scenario, one thing to be able to calculate, one, one good thing that you should know how to calculate for all these questions to be able to tell what type of risk profile you are, is you need to be able to calculate the expected value. It's really a fancy way of saying the average, but we're going to weigh it by different amounts as we'll, we'll get to. So here, it's simple enough because the expected value of option A, the expected value of option A is just, well, let's see, 50% of the time, we're going to get zero dollars. So it's 0.5 times zero plus 50% of the time you're going to get 10,000. So 10K. So by the way, if you're not familiar with it from earlier, the formula for the expected value of X is really just, it looks messy at first, scary at first, but it's really the sum of P of X times X. So really what that's saying is to find the expected value, the sort of average, it's like, you know, 50%, that's the P of X times the amount that you get, zero, plus, that's the sum, and the same thing. So here, there was only two options, so it's 0.5 times that amount, plus 0.5 times how much you get in that other case. So here, if we do the math, we just get 5,000, because it's uh, zero times anything is zero, and half, 0.5 times 10,000 is that. So the expected value, on average, you can expect to get five grand, right? Because it's really, you're averaging zero and 10,000 equally, so you could just add them up and divide it by two, but that won't always work if they're not equally likely. Here, heads and tails are equally likely, but here, the expected value of B, let's see, there's just a 100% probability, so one, that you're gonna get $5,000, and that's it, that's all that's happening. So really, the expected value is 5,000. So here, these two options have the exact same expected value. Whenever we have that scenario, that's when you can definitely tell what type of person they are based on which option they choose. If two things have, you know, a different expected value and they choose the one with the higher expected value, you really can't tell whether they're risk averse, risk loving, risk neutral, but if they have the exact same expected value, then you can definitely tell that the person who picks the riskier option where you might get more or you might get less, they're risk loving. The person who picks the safer option would be risk averse. And the person who's totally indifferent, they just can't choose, they're risk neutral. So one thing we can generalize is anyone who's risk neutral will always simply pick the option with the higher expected value. So if you're risk neutral, how do you operate? You're just like, oh, on average, I'll get about five grand here, here, I'll get about five grand, so I really don't care. Now a risk averse person, that's what I am personally, that's probably what most of you are, You'd look at these two and you'd say, hmm, they're about the same expected value. Do I really want to risk getting zero? Sure, I could get 10,000, but you know what? It's much safer if I just get the five for sure. That way I don't have any regrets. You know, sure, you know, I, I, about getting zero. So that's me. I would personally pick option B, which means I am risk averse. Now, you might have somebody who's like, ah, who cares really about the 5,000? I might as well just like, you know, try to get the 10, and if I lose, man, you know, at least I had the chance of getting the 10. So they'd pick option A and they're risk loving. So that's how you can tell what type of person you are. But again, on the other hand, if we were to switch these numbers around, if, if we were to make this now, uh, you know, 100,000 or something like that, right? Now the expected value here is 50,000. 
Now even a risk averse person like me might still choose option A, and uh, that's that's still consistent. It doesn't mean you're risk loving necessarily because you just pick the one with the higher uh, expected value, uh, and so you might pick the one with the higher expected value regardless of what type you are. But if you're risk neutral, then you definitely know you'd pick this one. Now here's a question for you: Why would anyone want to maybe ever buy insurance? And how do insurance companies make profits? Like, how does that even work if they're, you know, paying out money a lot? Well, let's take a scenario where you have a risk-averse person who just bought a car, and they have a 10% chance of getting into an accident. Now, if they get into an accident, let's say they have to pay $10,000 in damages if they just total their car, but 90% of the time they're not getting into an accident, and they have to pay zero dollars in car expenses. So. Let's think about whether they might want to buy insurance or not. Now, here, what is their expected expense? The expected expense, the expected value, we could say is, let's see, 90% of the time, they have to pay zero, plus 10% of the time, they have to pay 10,000. So really, that's zero times anything is zero. 0 0.1 times 10,000 is 1,000. So um, on average, I'm expecting to pay about $1,000. Notice it was really averaging zero and 10,000, but it wasn't just five because we wanted to give a lot more weight to the zero, so it ended up being a lot closer to zero. But either way, I'm expecting, let's say I'm a risk averse person and I'm facing these numbers and I'm deciding, should I buy car insurance or not? And uh, I know that, all right, on, on average, I'm expecting to pay out you know, uh, $1,000, but what if somebody else were to offer me what's called fair insurance? So if somebody were to offer me a fair premium, an actuarially fair, that's the full name, actuarially fair premium of $1,000, what if they were to say, all right, how about this, Rohan, you know, how about you just have to pay me $1,000 and uh, that's it. If your car gets total, we'll cover the full $10,000. And I'm thinking, hey, you know what? Either way, I've got the same expected value by taking the risk on my own versus just buying insurance. So if I'm a risk averse person, I would get way more happiness, utility out of this than out of this, even though they have the same expected value. See, if I were a risk neutral person, I really wouldn't care. But I'm risk averse, so I would prefer to just pay an insurance company $1,000 no matter what. So that way, if my car gets total, I never am stuck with the $10,000 bill. Now, why would an insurance company want to take me up on this offer? Well, because they're thinking 90% of the time, you know, they're actually getting, uh, they're getting the thousand, but they don't have to pay anything because 90% of the time I don't get into an accident. So in that case, they just earn a thousand dollars. And, uh, but 10% of the time they do have to pay out a lot. And so they would in that case lose uh, $10,000. On average though, they're breaking even. They're not really making a loss because they're on average 10% of the time, you know, paying that 90% of the time, that's, that, that balances out. They're making zero profit now. But here's the thing, you can now actually, so from their perspective, because I'm risk averse, if they did want to make a profit, they actually could make a little bit of a profit by, uh, by charging me a slightly higher premium. What if they charge me like, like 1100 instead, right? In my mind, I'm thinking, hmm, even though this is like, and it's weird though here, since we're looking at the expense, we, I want the lower expected value technically. So if I was risk neutral though, I would definitely pick the thousand over the 1100, right? Because I want to ex have a lower expense. But since I'm risk averse, I'd be willing to pay, you know, an extra hundred if it means that's it, that I'll never ever be stuck with a $10,000 bill. So I'd rather in my mind, even though the average is I'm paying a little bit more on average, in my mind, I'm okay paying $1,100 every year, no matter what, rather than, you know, waking up and saying, do I have to pay zero or 10,000? Is my car totaled or not? So rather than me living with, living with the risk, I'd rather, it's, it's like I'm paying a premium to be able to not have the risk. So at the end of the day, if I were to, if they were to offer me this, I would probably take them up on that insurance. And that way I'm safe in my mind. I pay 1100, I never have to worry. And in their mind, here's the thing about the insurance company. I'm not their only client. So one way they eliminate their risk is by what's called, uh, you know, pooling. So what they can do is they can offer insurance like this to thousands and thousands of people across the country. And now on average, 
you know, they are on average getting 1100 bucks from their customers and on, on average they're paying out a thousand because they're now taking that risk. So on average, they are making about a hundred bucks per person. Again, on any individual person they might have lost, uh, on any individual person they might have won in the sense that they didn't have to pay anything but they got their 1100 bucks. But either way, on average, because you do it over thousands and thousands of people, on average, they probably are going to make a lot of money and profit. So that's one way to eliminate their risk. Now, another way in general to avoid risk is what's called diversification. So that's like if you're investing in the stock market rather than, let's say you have $1,000 and you're wondering, hmm, should I buy $1,000 worth of Google stock or Apple stock, right? Because you're thinking, if you're thinking one of them might like totally double and you're going to double your money, then you're kind of like, all right, uh, you're kind of worried because what if you invest in Google, but then the other company was the one that doubled, not this one, you know? What if you invested in the wrong one? So one thing you can do is just split your money. 500 in, 500 in Google, 500 in Apple. That way at least you're guaranteed that half of your money will double if, if you knew, for example, that one of them was going to double and you just didn't know which one. So in general, diversifying is one way you can kind of uh, get risk-averse results, you know, without having to actually take the risk. So.